The gold is 23.58, up 15. Remember, big spike on Friday, big sell-off late in the day, bounce back up to Friday's unchanged number. Silver does not care about Friday's activity, trading 28.49, up 64 cents, very strong. Welcome to the Morning Markets and Metals with Vince Lancey, where each day he brings you the precious metals and financial news to get you ready for your day. And now, here's Vince. Okay, good morning. I'm Vince Lancey, and in today's market rundown, we're going to talk about the Russian ban on metals, its effect on copper and aluminum, as well as rundown and hopefully give you the framework to look at the Israeli um, uh, Iran situation. All right, so we'll look at some market driving news too, which is all the same thing today, but let's get going. All right, uh, where are we? Here we go. The markets. The dollar is down 12 after being up on Friday because of war fears. 10 year yields are up five. The SP 500 is up 28 handles at 5151. 5150 for you, Van Allen fans, seems to be a really important level right now. It's really chopping around there a lot. Uh, the VIX is 16.99, backing off a little bit. The gold is 23.58, up 15. Remember, big spike on Friday, big sell-off late in the day. Bounce back up to Friday's unchanged number. Silver uh, does not care about Friday's activity. Trading 28.49, up 64 cents, very strong. Copper is surprisingly uh, kind of unchanged, up. Uh, four tenths of a of a penny at four twenty nine eighty seven. So that's like ten basis points. Oil is down forty three cents after spiking on Friday, rallying. I wouldn't say spiking. Natural gas one seventy one. We don't care. Uh, Bitcoin is up five hundred three at sixty six one ninety four. Uh, sell off into the Iraq uh, into the Iran uh, uh, the Iran attack. Right. Sell off into the Iran attack. Big bounce down to sixty thousand. Big bounce, stable in this area now. Ethereum, 3245 up 89. Platinum, Palladium, both down moderately. Uh, Palladium, 1044 down four. Platinum, 969 down six. Doesn't seem to be the uh, Russian band. Doesn't seem to have an effect on those metals, at least tonight. Grains are all down. Soybeans are down a penny at 1168. Corn is 428 down a penny. And wheat is 557 down seven cents over a penny. Uh, over over a percent, I should say. Okay, these are the stories from the weekend. This story, uh, it's a must-read story if you're a precious metals person. Uh, one bank, uh, they're not a bullion bank, but they're a very important bank globally. Uh, they said the quiet part out loud. And we have the whole uh, transcript of what was said there. So that's a, that's a must-read. Uh, Goldman raised their price target on uh, gold, 2700 and this is the mainstream media news we just put out. We're going to touch on that in a second because that's important to what's going on today. Okay, let's get to the main story. Goldman says stay long copper and aluminum. This obviously came from their British desk. Okay, we have excerpts from a Goldman report out today. No one else has it. One other person has it, and that's the person who gave it to us. You're not going to see this anywhere else, at least not at this hour. You're not going to see this anywhere else probably today. You're not going to see this anywhere else probably over the next week. Uh, but you're going to see it here because this is where the real information is. Uh, anyway, thank God for technology and social media. That said, let's read an excerpt from it. Metal's comment. Assessing the LME Russian ban impact. Now, this is a Goldman report. It's a factual report. They're giving you information to make your own decisions, but they do have a recommendation. That recommendation is to stay long copper and stay long aluminum. Even if you're not a copper person, that's significant. Staying long copper is saying stay long silver. All right, here we go. It is important to recognize that these exchange-focused rule adjustments are taking place in an environment where fundamentals for copper and aluminium are inflecting into a sustained tightening direction after two benign years 
for fundamentals in 2022 and 2023. Now, there are about 12 charts. This one is here is Russian metal already represents 90% of total aluminum stocks and increasing share of nickel and copper. Interestingly, you're thinking about nickel, they're saying uh, nickel's not, not, not where to be on this one. Another comment later. Exhibit two, China now imports a substantial amount of Russian exports and likely to increase volumes on price incentive ahead. That comment is an implication of like, when the price of oil went down, China bought more from Russia. So if the price of Russian copper were to go down because of sanctions, China will buy more. That's what's going on. So next paragraph. Indeed, the strong performance of the industrial metals complex over the years so far is a trend we expect to gather momentum ahead. This view particularly resonates with copper and aluminum. They don't mention silver to support. This is about base metals. Uh, but this is this is where they're going in the context. Over the last year and a half, there's been plenty of copper overhang, plenty of production out there. And you hear people talk about the spreads. And that has weighed down on price. It's been stable, but it hasn't been the rocket that they want. Now, with China uh, uh, doing a mini bazooka uh, and the overhang of metal kind of disappearing, very similar to what happens with, uh, with uranium, uh, they got structurally bullish on the market. This puts that into overdrive. Now, uh, so they're saying that there's just going to be not enough copper and aluminum around. Copper, the muted effect that it is, uh, something to watch. Aluminum is up 6%, okay? Uh, silver is up, you know, 2%, 2.4% now. I trade silver when I hear bullish information on copper. That's the bottom line. Uh, and we'll talk about that later on. Okay, that's the report. We have all of it at the bottom uh, for premium subscribers. So moving on. Market news. All right. This is this is this market news is going to be Iran Israel. All right. What we're going to try and do if you're watching now, right? Nine in the morning, 8 30 in the morning. If you're watching now, you're probably going to be hit out there with Two types of information, right? On the mainstream media, if you watch that still, you're going to get uh you're going to get facts that are spun and tilted towards what they want to tell you. Israel defended itself successfully, right? Right? Iran killed Israel. You're going to see facts that aren't facts. So I'm going to try and and then the other side of it will be social media. You'll get takes, and I, I'm I'm guilty of takes too. I think Iran's in trouble. I think Israel's in trouble. You know, that's stuff like that. But those are all legitimate analysis. They're just it's just speculation. So I'm going to try and give you a trading desk geopolitical analysis. What happened? Right, we're having a little conversation here. Well, not a conversation, a meeting. What happened? Iran attacked Israel directly. Why did Iran do that? This is not sarcasm because they're Israel and they're Iran. Now, the approximate reasons was Iran uh, got fed up with recent activities by Israel. Uh, how successful was the attack? Well, materially, little to no, data-wise, excellent. Now, Israel supporters will cite the missile failures, apparently up to 50%. This is reported. We don't even know what's true anymore. It's reported that up to 50% of the Iranian missiles or drones or whatever they were using did not launch. So it's a big missile failure. People who support Iran are saying, uh, despite the uh, public describing it as a failure, nothing got through, one area got through, and that was the area they wanted to get through towards an air base. So it was a success from that point of view. Depends on who you talk to. Now, going back to... Uh, my comment up top, little to no uh, material success, but data-wise excellent. All war is data collection. So in Ukraine, when you see us send uh, an old shitty tank or an F-15 Eagle from the mid-80s to help Ukraine, that's to help us. It allows us to give them cannon fodder so we can see what Russia is going to throw at it. Okay? You don't send your best out there. So... Iran was a big attack, and it was a very dispersed attack. It's feasible, and some intelligent people have said, 
you know, all war is data collecting. This is a good way to find out how Israel operates, right? You you throw everything at it uh, in almost like a well-telegraphed uh, attack, and you get an idea of how they react to things. And, you know, there are ways around defenses now. You know, walls are knocked down by missiles, you know, uh, and then new missiles can't penetrate new walls. So that's, that's how it works. Now, it's data collecting on both sides, but mostly Iran gets the data from this. Iran gets feedback on where their missiles had a problem, right? Where their shortcomings were in launch. Their core, and they get the practice. It's a practice run, right? It's also a data run. Now, whether how important this data is for them or not, I don't know, but this is not the backwards Iran that used to, used to rig up an extra donkey to the oil drill to get it to get more oil out. This is Iran that's been armed and war is changing now. Okay, that's the uh, that's the how successful was it uh, spiel. What was Israel's response? Well, Israel was threatening to respond and then said no response for the first 48 hours. Uh, what kind of response will they have? What, 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 what kind of responses could they have? Will it be asymmetric? Will it be commensurate? Or will it be weak? We don't know. Anyone tells you they do know or gives you a take on it, fine. I can give you all the takes you want, but we're not doing that now, right? There will be, from people that I trust, there will be a difficulty in an air attack, right? Someone I talked to who's in Taiwan, uh, he said it's two hours to get from Israel uh, to Iran, and the airspace they have to go over uh, is going to alert other people, whether it's you know, whether it's Jordan or what have you. And uh, if it's Israel doing the attacking, they'll get a two-hour heads up if it's jets. Okay? Uh, so that makes it difficult in the air attack. Then, of course, there's U.S. involvement. So U.S. involvement would change the uh, metrics as well. But notice that we're not saying U.S. involvement is a given now. And that's symptomatic of Pax Americana ending. Why did, uh, why did they do that? Why did Israel not attack? Well... It was possibly a U.S. request. Uh, take the win is rumored to be what Biden said to Netanyahu. Uh, politics could be involved. Possibly Israel knows a multi-front war is not winnable without nukes. Israel can beat Hamas. Israel can beat Hezbollah. And Israel can beat both of them together. But Israel cannot beat an attack from the north, the east, and the west at the same the west at the same time. That's a multi-front war, and the whole Middle East would turn against them, and you don't want that. And the, that would leave them with one thing that they have that no one else has, and that's a nuclear bomb. Conventional war would starve them, especially when they're throwing, you know, electronic rocks at you now. You know, they used to throw rocks. Then they were lighting kites on fire, right, and throwing them into Israel. Now they're using drones. Same idea. You know, it's 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 decentralized. It's inexpensive. It's modern guerrilla warfare. Okay, so uh, what will happen next? That's the question. There's either going to be no response, a delayed response, or coordinated response, right? So coordinated with U.S. So U.S. politics and Israeli politics matter, meaning Biden is worried about his election. Sadly, it's part of the calculus. And Netanyahu uh, is not well-liked in Israel. I've been to Israel, and despite its uh, uh, its almost being a theocratic state, it's very secular within the country. So and Netanyahu is not well liked. Uh, so there you have it. Moving to the data. Today, retail, U.S. retail sales for March are out. And uh, we have a moderate week, but tomorrow is probably the more important day because Powell's going to speak again. In the premium, we have Goldman's analysis. Uh, and uh, let's take a quick look at the charts. I didn't do that yet. Uh, we'll talk about gold here. All right, the hourly on gold. Okay, so Friday, this is the range we're in. Friday, the market starts to take off on the open. Ramps, this was shorts covering at first and longs getting in, and then more shorts covering. And then at some point, right before Europe closes, that's the Bank of International Settlements territory, the market starts to get crushed. It gets crushed to uh, here, which is essentially unchanged on the day, and then has another leg lower, 
to the previous day. So it undid 48 hours of activity in several hours. Then the market stabilizes, spikes higher because of the, uh, well, ostensibly because of the war, and now stabilizes up $15. Silver is a much prettier story. Both both stories are pretty in my point, in my case. Same idea, same chart pattern, silver, but they pushed it down a little bit lower. This reeks of someone selling silver to buy gold, in my opinion. And the market now is on what I would call, an, it's not necessarily an algo, but it's an algo pattern. If you want to take the silver and gold behavior in context of what was dominant, you know, during the day, well, you had a short covering rally, the market got out of hand, somebody said, sell it, and it got sold. Now, the selling going into the weekend, frankly, uh, kept a lid on it, right? A lot of commodities got hit yesterday as well. In fact, here, I'll show you, I'll show you oil. Oil has a similar pattern, right? Here's oil, right? Here's the ramp up, here's the sell off, and then it kept going. Notice oil kept going despite a Middle Eastern war risk. Oil has bounced since then, but not much. That's key. Oil is rallying off lower lows relative to gold's rally, relative to silver's rally. They want the gold. You know, they want the silver now too, it would seem. They really don't want the oil. I mean, they want the oil. Don't get me wrong, but pay attention to that. All three commodities, let's just say gold and, and oil. Gold and oil are subject to the Middle Eastern crisis. Both rallied, both sold off. Gold bounced harder than oil during the Middle Eastern crisis. That should tell you that gold's stronger than oil. It also could imply that this rally is not really Middle Eastern based. Gold is rallying because they, they want it. They, they, they want the gold. And so there's buying that's relentless underneath the market. Okay, uh, that's it. Let's look at copper for a second, since, since that's what they're talking about. Where is copper? Here we go. Oh, I must have moved it. Did I demote copper? Copper, right? So here's your run-up. Here's your sell-off. And copper is doing the same thing, right? Run-up sell off and now the market is retraced most of its run up except for this long wick here okay so you could say that's you can't say that's middle east you can say it's uh uh russia so my my advice my observation is there are buyers in all commodities underneath and all are looking for excuses to buy some are hoping for dips oil has the most patient buying right now copper has it would seem the least patient buying, but they're disciplined, right? Gold has some impatient buyers who may have been pulled out of the market, and now we can see what the market's going to do. Finally, back to silver. Uh, silver's recoupling with gold. And if silver recouples with gold in a good way, that means when gold's up a percent, silver's up 2%. So I don't think people are selling gold as much as they used to. Every dip is being bought. We shall see how the week goes. I'm Vince. Don't forget to subscribe. Have a great week. Thanks for watching this morning's Markets and Metals Update with Vince Lancy. Brought to you each day by Miles Franklin Precious Metals, where this week's special is one ounce 2023 dated silver Cougarans for only $3.10 over spot. Cougarans come from the South African Mint, one of the six major sovereign mints and are IRA eligible. Find out more by calling Miles Franklin at 833-326-4653 or email us at arcadia at milesfranklin.com. Please note that this video is not intended as legal licensed financial trading advice and is to be used for informational purposes only. Please contact your financial advisor before making any decisions. And thanks for watching.